Hey everybody, welcome to Equity Guru. Uh, we are talking today to Ian Patterson from Pluralock. Uh, P-L-U-R is the ticker symbol. Um, look, Ian, just to, to get uh, disclosures out of the way, you were you're a former client of Equity Guru, um, but we've been talking for a, a couple of years now, maybe maybe three years, um, about what it is that your company does and how it's criminally undervalued. Um, just in the last couple of days, Pluralock has come storming back and and still, to my mind, uh, is way undervalued. The, the, the jump in share price, um, it looks like a, a whole lot of trading volume, but realistically, you've got a tight float. You just had a rollback. So it doesn't take much to move the needle right now. Um, but if you could explain to people what's different between Pluralock a month ago and Pluralock today. You know, it, it's interesting. Actually, I was going back through some older, uh, some older news items, and and in March, the Globe and Mail put us on a top ten list, uh, and we were one of the top ten most undervalued companies um, at that time. Uh, so, you know, it's it's <laughs> it's not our words. The, the Globe and Mail were saying it, right? Um, you know, I think that that it's been a it's been a tough couple of years uh, for companies generally that are publicly traded. I think technology companies in particular, and small cap companies even more particularly. And so, when you have technologies plus small cap, uh, you know, it, it's been it's been a really tough couple of years. I think in Pluralock's case, we had a number of things going against us. Um, we, in order to continue operations and and to try and keep keep going, we accumulated some debt. Uh, we we did a number of smaller financings. Uh, you know, I think at one point we were we were raising money every four months, um, and uh, we had a, 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 a we we did we were not adequately communicating our path to break even. Um, and so, if I look at at how we did last year, I think those are the things going against us. What did we do this spring? Well, a couple of things. One, uh, there was enough interest and recognition around the undervalued. Um, uh, position that our, our stock was in that that we we went out to raise three million dollars. We wanted to uh, convert that debt. We wanted to get get rid of as much as possible. We also did a rollback, and that three million dollar raise then became four and a half million, and then became five and a half million at a higher price. Mm. So I think that there was there was a very strong uh, rally in in the in the fact that we have seventy million dollars of top line revenue. Uh, we have some of the most prestigious and discerning customers in the world. Uh, we we announced three weeks ago a uh, six million dollar order with U.S. Department of Treasury. Uh, we we can name that one because it's it's in the public records. Obviously, mm-hmm. we can't name uh, some of the commercial clients that we're working with. Although we did put out a press release earlier this week uh, announcing um, uh, two hundred ninety thousand dollars of of high end security consulting work with a with an S and P five hundred semiconductor client. And you know, I think we're we're starting to shake off some of those um, uh, negative aspects that that I think have have uh, haunted us over the last couple of years. So, short answer to your question: um, we got rid of debt, raised capital, uh, cleaned up the balance sheet, cleaned up the cap table, and and we're starting to see a lot of interest as a result. So, I, I would tell you one of the things that was kind of a, a an anchor around your neck for a long time there was the I think the perception. From a lot of quarters that hey you need to raise money every quarter to keep the lights on what happens if a quarter comes along where you can't raise money uh it will plural lock cease to be the fact that you're still around is a, a big selling point right now because it's just shown that when the chips are down you managed to make it still work you didn't have to go through a fire sale you didn't have to sack all your employees and you didn't have to do uh, uh bananas uh super cheap uh, raise with people who are going to be selling you for the next two years. Um, survival is a is a is a marketing niche uh, in this market. I think it is. I, I mean, I, I wish we could have avoided it. Absolutely. You know, I, I wished that uh, going going back in hindsight, 2020, 2021, I wish that we had grown bigger, faster. I wish that we had gotten uh, more cash flow up front uh, and, and we didn't do it. And as a result, um, you know, we we had to we had to take some punches. You know, I think I think at the big at the end of the day, the the big picture, the strategy for us to go public originally was we wanted to buy distribution and we wanted to cross sell and upsell higher margin products and services. Mm-hmm. I mean, we accomplished some of that. We 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 did acquire the distribution. 
Um, as we all know, the the solutions business for us, which is the the reseller business, is fairly thin margin. I mean, that was not going to be our path to cash flow break even. It was it was a means to an end. The end being the the cross selling upselling. Um, you know, I think I think the other thing that we're showing right now is that the the path to break even is from higher margin services, which is coming from this new team, critical services, um, which are in very high demand. We've seen very strong growth in services revenue. From 2022, uh, we did about six hundred thousand dollars in services revenue. Last year, we did approximately two point six million in services revenue. We're announcing contracts now from the critical services team that are, are larger in size, but that are from the same customers, meaning that we're doing good work, we're getting recognized for doing good work, and we're being asked to do more work. Right. And like these, these are all, uh, I think, data points along this trend line of, of getting to break even, um, and therefore taking away that objection of, no, we don't have to raise again to, to keep going. The consulting work is it's not just high margin it's it's money for nothing right you're already paying people uh you're basically being able to farm them out for a much higher price um you just released a news release that announced that you did a three hundred thousand dollar or so add-on to an existing client with that department um you know if we're honest a lot of juniors on the public markets release news that they're opening a new department we've got an ai department now you know like and it's all smoke and mirrors right it's all just like let's fill the news cycle but this latest news release people might look at the the total figure and say 300,000 uh, yeah. but it, what it is it's evidence that that department is real and that it's adding to your ability to cross sell so every existing client now that's an opportunity to tack on another 300 or another 500 another 800 well and and that that sale in particular i mean again this is so critical services uh, on average 40 to 50 percent gross margin so if you take just round numbers if you take 300,000 uh you know at a, at a 50 percent margin that's 150 grand of, of gross profit i mean the, the kpi for us as a business is is to look at our gross profit um, even more so than revenue. We have great top line revenue, and and we've we've grown top line revenue even despite um, you know the, the tough markets. If, if I look back, 2020 we had approximately half million dollars of revenue. 2021 36 million. 2022 64 million. Last year 2023 was 70 million dollars. So we can grow top line revenue. The the most important metric right now is to grow the gross profit. And that could be done in one of two ways. We can continue growing top line revenue and that will grow gross profit. The other thing that we can do is, is given uh, you know, 12 hours in a workday, uh, it's more than eight, you know, given 12 hours in a workday, can we allocate more time towards selling critical services at a 40 or 50% gross margin rather than uh, you know, a million dollars at a 5% gross margin. Obviously right. one of those two is gonna net a lot more gross profit, potentially at the detriment of revenue. And in fact, in Q1 of this year, top line revenue actually went down a little bit. Um, we were not worried because top line revenue went down, gross profit actually went up and it also reduced the, the EBITDA loss. Um, and so again, like that's, we're, we're, we're showing how we're going to get to, uh, to the, the promised land of where we want to get to, which is break even. So that 5 million that, that came rolling in, uh, that must've been a, a relief number one, because I, you've been doing raises for much smaller amounts over the last couple of years. Uh, but two, where does that money go to in the in the short and long term? Well, so it was it was five point five, Chris. Let's not yeah. let, let's let's not lose, wanna, let's lose sight of the other five hundred. I don't want to understand you. <laughs> um, so for us, what we said was we see potential uh, opportunity to scale up critical services. We want to add additional capabilities. Up until now, the the services part of the business had had not had dedicated salespeople. So not only have we seen a bunch of growth there, but it's actually been a bunch of growth without having a, a proper go-to-market team. So we wanted to to staff that up. So that was that was the the key the key objective that we wanted to do. Um, we also uh, um, were able to convert into equity some of the debt that we had, and so we were successful in that regard. And then we were able to to just tighten up a number of, of balance sheet items. So so those were those were the items. I I will say that. Uh, I was I was surprised um, at the amount of of response that we got, and so the fact that it was upsized um, from um, you know from the original three million, and then it, and then it, it went to five and a half, and again at a at a slightly higher price, 
Um, like these are all, I think, really good signs that that we are on to something and that there is support for us. That's uh, you're in a space where I, th I think I'm correct in saying valuations can turn on a dime and become much larger really quickly and still be justified. You know, if you look at Palantir as an example, you know, or if we look at some of the uh, the other tech companies where the difference between being a $20 million company and a $100 million company isn't always revenue, it's public perception, it's a couple of hires, it's one new partner. Um, your market cap, though your share price has rocketed in the past two weeks, is still only 22 million I'm looking at today. Um, compared to revenue of, of 70 on an annualized basis. To be trading at one third annual revenue is generally the, restricted for the, the sort of companies that are on death watch. So I, I would think that anyone who's looking at the, 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 the share price action over the last couple of weeks and saying, well, I missed the boat on that, misses completely that there's only 40 million shares out. Like you've really tightened this thing up to the place where it, not only does it have a bit more trust because your your debt's in better shape, you've got cash in hand, but uh, everyone can make money on this thing. So I think that if you look at some of the comps in the uh, in the solution space or in the VAR space, um, I think I, my understanding is we're still at a, trading at a, at a deep discount to to those. So I think that that speaks to to what you were talking about. I think the other thing too is that even within the capital markets. There in the Canadian capital markets, there can be a, a a lack of appreciation for business performance. As an example, one of the things that changed this past spring is we added Ali Hakimzada as as exec chair, um, and his his last company was a company called HS GovTech, also um, publicly traded, um, and they were taken out by a, a private equity firm at 150 percent premium to market. Uh, last fall. So, you know, I think that there's there's a um, opportunity for uh, for folks, whether it's in the public markets, whether it's in the private markets, to take advantage of things that are mispriced. So is is that the the strategic plan and goal at this point is to get this thing to a place where someone will come in and give you 150% premium, preferably not from a $22 million market cap, but somewhere much higher? I, th I think that the, the the goal is to create shareholder value, whether that's done through the, the th through the public markets, whether that's done through a privatization, whether that's done through some sort of acquisition into another public company. You know, ultimately, I, I invested a, a meaningful amount of money uh, for myself into the into the last financing. I am I am motivated to try and uh, get that value to appreciate as much as I possibly can. I, I think that the uh, you know we're in a we're in an interesting time right now, both in the capital markets with where we are with rates and potentially those are coming down. We're also in a really interesting time from a cybersecurity perspective. Th there's been two huge uh, paradigm shift tailwinds that are occurring. One is this this movement from a perimeter based. Uh, architecture to a zero trust based architecture. If you think about, you know, why did Cisco make so much money? Why did Palo Alto Networks uh, make so much money? Why did Zscaler make so much money? A lot of it was because organizations had to buy firewalls, but firewalls haven't been enough. You, know, you think about all the firewalls deployed while well, people are still getting ransomed, people are still clicking on phishing links, firewalls don't actually right. help with that. Right. Well, what's the answer? Well, the answer is you have to move to a zero trust architecture rather than trusting somebody who is inside a firewall or inside a perimeter and not trusting if you're outside, actually, you can't trust anybody. Um, you, just this week, the, the US Air Force published their zero trust strategy, which came about a year after the, the White House put out an executive order mandating all US government agencies to have a zero trust, uh, to have a zero trust strategy. So the migration, and, and to be clear, getting to a zero trust, I mean, this is this is re-architecting networks, this is re like, this is a massive amount of work and time and money that by the way these customers don't have the skill sets to do right so that's so that's number one number two which is the segue is that there are four million cyber jobs vacant right now so even if a business is fully uh fully uh cashed up believes and understands and knows that they need to make these changes to be secure or to be compliant with their insurance or industry regulations etc they, they and oftentimes don't have the skill sets internally to be able to do it and, and you ask the question why Part of it is that it's if you're a, a big manufacturing company, of which we we have a number of customers, you're not a sexy place to work in comparison to you know a high growth technology company. So so that's a problem. 
The second problem, though, is that there's not enough skilled people out there. Again, right. 4 million jobs unfilled. And so these customers have to turn to partners like Pluralock to be able to do the work. And again, that's feeding into, you know, why are we being, why are we seeing so much success with critical services? We have the skill sets, number one. Number two, we have the customers already. We have hundreds of customers through the solutions division that we have been, uh, we have a trusted relationship. We've been providing them capabilities for years to the tunes of millions of dollars. And that gives us the trust and the opportunity to then upsell uh, a critical services deal at a higher margin. So let's for the people that are, are are uninformed on what zero trust is, uh, to summarize, when I type in my password and say yes, it's me, um, the system is pretty sure that's me at that point. Pretty sure, not a hundred percent. Um, but once I go and get a coffee and walk away from my computer or click on a link that I shouldn't and something's happening in the background, your system watches my habits, watches what I do on a regular basis the keystrokes, the mouse movements, the tabs that are open. And if that changes, someone up in IT or IT security gets a note to say, hey, build down in accounting is uh, something weird's happening. He might be having a stroke, but there also might be someone sitting at his machine in a so, nutshell. So that vision that you just, so that was a very good articulation of that vision. I think in that vision, you talked about some technology that needs to, to be in place. You talked about some processes that need to be in place. You talked about some awareness of where your users are and what they're doing that also needs to be in place. Some of those can be solved with technology products. Some of those have to be solved through, through people and process. And, and again, not all customers have the right people or know how to put those processes in place. So it's so really we, we talk about the term solution. Solution is not a, a generalization. Solution really means people, process, and technology. With Pluralock, we can sell you the technology. We can also sell you the, the the people or the capability, the knowledge, the insight to be able to adequately deploy that technology and also help you develop those processes. And that ultimately is the thing that the customers need. Again, to stay safe, to stay compliant, you can't buy security as a as a as a technology product uh, and just hope it works out of the box. It just it doesn't it doesn't work that way. And and we know that that doesn't work because ransomware. Uh, has been on the rise for many years. Phishing has been on the rise for many years. Every um, every business owner that I talk to is is talking about getting hit with gift card scams. Right? There, there's no single piece of technology that's going to solve those things for sure. you. The yeah, I mean, I think everyone listening to this, watching this, is probably on their third spam call of the day from an Indian call center. Um, it, it strikes me that what I'm hearing is is that maybe Pluralock has moved away from being the McAfee uh, of InfoSec to the McKinsey. You know, rather than a product, it's a a, a solution, as you it's said. It's both. Yeah, yeah, it's it's both. I think I, I think that the the analogy. I'll, I'll give you a a car analogy. Um, I I think that I think that if you're in the mechanic business, you know, if if your business is a car. I think that there are a lot of product companies that are trying to sell you shinier headlights, that are trying to sell you slightly more optimized brakes, that are trying to sell you products. And that has that has value. I think that the position that, that we're in right now with Pluralock is we're like um we're like the specialist mechanic that you take your uh German uh, old German automobile too, when the check engine light comes on and there's a knocking sound in the engine. And when you get to us, you know that it's going to be expensive, even just rolling onto the lot. You know, it, you know it's going to cost you some money, but you have mm -hmm. to do it because that that German automobile is powering your business. It's running your factories. It's running your emails. And so you don't have a choice. You have to take it to somebody. Mm -hmm. have, and, and when you do, you're going to spend some mechanic time. You're going to probably have to buy a bunch of parts, but you develop trust with, with that mechanic because they know your business and you, you go to them for the advice in addition to the actual work. That's the business that we are in. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a must have. It's not a nice to have. And I think as we go into a, an uncertain economic environment with uh, budget freezes happening, with layoffs happening, we are absolutely in a business that is a must-have and that is becoming 
a greater must have than it was in years past. It, it's when people call you, uh, when you get sales meetings, is it generally in a, as a result of a close call or worse, or is it, our uh, companies genuinely, uh, at that place where they're being proactive? All, all of the above. Usually, though, you can trace you can trace it back to in an enterprise. You can trace it back to risk, and in a lot of cases, there will be a central risk registry where you you consolidate all of your risks, and the the risk for IT resiliency, the risk for network security, the risk for identity security is up or it is escalating, and it it shines out like a bright orange or red light on on a dashboard right. and those risk registries frequently are board materials that have to get briefed and so it's not just that a, a director of it is concerned about something this is actually going up it, it gets it gets shown to the cfo gets shown to the ceo and it gets shown to the board of directors and it becomes a, a corporate issue because as a board of directors and as directors and officers, you don't want to be the guy who said, nah, this risk, now nah, let's let's not worry let's about it. Let's put it, it off for a few months. Yeah. Yeah. You can't you can't do that. Yeah. I think there's someone at Ticketmaster looking for a new job right now as a result of that sort of thinking. Um having a stock that's running as hard as it is right now. And and you know, for it's uh from from your standpoint. How confident are you that this trend will continue based on uh, the underlying value of the business, news that's coming, uh, and your, I guess, the network of of uh, your new president, who seems to have come in at, I wouldn't say at the right time, I'd say he's he is the time. It seems like he's put together the right. Well, I... That's, that sounds awfully, uh, awfully similar to to asking to predict the future. So I don't, I don't know what's what's going to happen in the future. What I would say though is that if you look behind us, we we have amassed enough data to show what we have been doing. And so some of that data is the revenue, some of that data is the the press releases around the specific customers that we are serving, either when we can name them or or, or uh, you know kind of generalizable yep. descriptions of who those customers that that we are serving. Uh, it's the capabilities that we have. Um, we also talk about uh, who some of our people are, especially the ones that are most notable, like our board of directors and advisors. Um, you know, we've we've amassed a lot more credibility and capability than where we were four years ago when we had, uh, you know, a, a, a great idea. We had a, we had a strategy. We had plans. We had intent. But we didn't have any of that data at that point. And so I think that there's, to a certain extent, there's a re-examination of, well, what, what is Pluralock today? What is that made up of? Um, and there's a lot more data points today around what we are doing, who we are serving, what it is that we are doing, why does that matter? And also the industry as well. I think that there's also a much greater appreciation for the importance of cybersecurity now sure. than pre-pandemic, uh, or even you know, during or post pandemic, there was certainly a large focus around work from home, but you don't really hear about work from home as much anymore. You are hearing about ransomware that are uh, ransomware attacks that are either shutting down companies that are preventing factories from working, that are preventing healthcare organizations from being able to deliver services. In some cases, deaths are associated with, with IT outages or with ransomware uh, events. That is now present and in, in our everyday vernacular. Right. And so what that's causing, I think, that what that's causing is individual investors to realize and say, hey, that matters. That matters, and I should have that in my portfolio. Yeah. I, I would think that, uh, you know, uh, to to finish my earlier thought that, you know, what is different between this and the 19 other companies that might be smoke and mirrors, one, it's not rising on the smoke. It's, it's not rising on on people sending out to giant emailing lists buy, 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 it's going to the moon. It's going up because it's undervalued, right? The, the, you've got that data point that's really important, which is revenue and revenue growth. And it doesn't make any sense for a company to be valued at one third of its annual revenue when it's not losing a fortune, when it's not at risk of falling off the twig. Um, so it seems to me that this is a situation where a couple of guys have helped write the ship on the balance sheet and started the ball rolling, and the rest of the market has said, oh, so Pluralock's still here, and and maybe it's actually real, and we can trust this thing. 
And not to be to belabor the point, but you've been around for a while. Uh, I think it's it's important that someone who's actually steering the ship is seen to be the guy that, when things were hard, stuck around. When things were difficult, and probably had opportunities to jump to other lily pads, knuckled down and said, "No, no, there's something really good here, and I can feel it, and I'm going to stay with it till it starts to to happen." I, I think I think that's true. I think the other thing is that what we are doing practically on an operational basis really matters. Our, our customers depend on us for safety, security, resiliency, uh, and we can directly see the impact of when we help a customer, even if it is, you know, reselling a firewall, uh, uh, that we can see the impact of that. Or we can see that that resell of a firewall that we just did uh, was because of a breach or because the last one got hacked or... Right. I mean, just recently, there was a, a, a large uh, security incident with a company called Avante. Uh, they had a lot of perimeter-based uh, capabilities, and a lot of our customers needed to swap them out right quick in a hurry um, to, to do something else. And so that that work matters. That's, that's why the team is motivated. Uh, whether markets are up or markets are down, the impact that we're having for customers is creating value. It may not always be reflected on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. One, one hopes that it, it would be. Uh, but, but it, it doesn't always, um, but that's fundamentally why we are doing what we're doing. We're, we're doing work that matters. It is for some of the most discerning customers in the world. And there's no limit to the amount of work that, uh, that is available for, for good, good, for, for good, uh, teams, uh, and good companies. So one of the strategies that you used early on to go from a new tech startup that has no trust with existing organizations, government agencies, et cetera, et cetera, to a company that is inside the, the beltway and is able to do business with the governments was acquire companies that were longstanding that had those connections and that level of trust. Is there, uh, are there still bodies on the list to potentially acquire to expand that? Or are you plugged into the point now where you're, you're your own beast? So I think I think that there there certainly are opportunities, um, and and I think even going back a couple of years when we were uh, very active uh, doing M and A, we never committed to to doing deals. We never committed to doing acquisitions. Um, what we said then and what we say now is that we will remain opportunistic. Uh, and so if something makes sense, if we think that we can create shareholder value as a result of doing a transaction, uh, absolutely, we will we will investigate that. I think the other thing that has changed now compared to this time last year is that we're a much better integrated platform. Uh, you know, a year ago, uh, we had we had not fully integrated all of the the acquisitions. And in fact, one of the changes that we made was uh, Scott Myers came in as, as CFO almost exactly a year ago now. Uh, within his first 90 days, he had realized uh, approximately $2 million of, of cost out of the business. Um, and not only not only reduction in cost, but also increase in velocity. Um, so being able to just go about your daily work uh, by using one system as, as opposed to five systems, because we had, you know, accumulated a bunch of systems. It, it's hard. It's hard to put your finger on on how much helpful that is, mm -hmm. but but it it, it does have a, a real impact. So where we sit today is that we are we are a platform. Uh, as a result of a number of acquisitions that we have made, we have contract vehicles and master service agreements with. Uh, uh, again, a very a very prestigious list of of customers, both public sector and private sector. Um, and we have the capacity and the experience now of having gone through a number of those acquisitions, been on the other side of it, and, and we certainly uh, are much better informed about um, you know what we think would would make sense uh, for us. So, answer to your question, we remain as always opportunistic, not not committing to to going down one path or another. Um, certainly, I think the fact though that that we are now past a lot of the uh, a lot of the heavy lift in terms of the integration, but also the um, uh, kind of the reset that we did this past spring. Not not every company is is uh, in that fortunate position. There are a number of companies that are still struggling to try and figure out what what they um, what they want to do, and um, you know those those might create opportunities. Well, man, just congratulations for one thing from somebody who's watched over the years. We've had a lot of conversations. I've always appreciated your ability to answer questions, frankly, um, uh, but also. Uh, completely honestly, I remember 
it's actually a story that I tell a lot of CEOs. It's the first time we ever sat down for an interview uh, in a cafe. First question didn't come from me. It came from you. And you said, what am I doing wrong? And I thought, okay, like this is somebody who wants to do a good job, isn't, isn't afraid to admit when other people might have some advice that he could use. And it's a very rare thing from a CEO in the public markets or any, frankly, any hemisphere uh, to be able to say, there are going to be other people in the room that have good ideas that I might not have had yet. Uh, and I'm open to everything. So I think that's been a thing that has, uh, I would think, brought good people around you who have the trust that you are what you say you are um, and helped you survive. And now it looks like it's the moment where Pluralock starts to be repriced to something that is justified. Well, Chris, I've, I've appreciated uh, your support and uh, having, you know, having worked together and also been uh, or also having been a shareholder at, at, at various times. Uh, sounds like you are again now. We, we appreciate that. Um, still. And, uh, still, still, still. There we go. Um, uh, and, and looking forward to hopefully having some, some more conversations this year. Yeah, man, for sure. We'll talk. That's again, that's Ian Patterson from Plural Lock and uh, P-L-U-R is the ticker symbol, as you can see above his head. Um, have a look, do due diligence. A reminder that this is not a paid interview. Um, this is a, a guy that respects when a good plan comes together and everybody's looking to make everybody whole. Thanks, Chris.